Yeah, am I, am I up? Okay. Good to go. Okay, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. It's uh, an honor to have Rabbi Shoshan here with us. Rabbi Shoshan is not just a rabbi, he is a rabbi's rabbi. And that when I need advice for something rabbinic, something about a shul, a kahila, so I only turn to a few specific people, and Rabbi Shoshan is one of them. Uh, we have a whole group of Rabbanim that turn to Rabbi Shoshan for guidance. So he always has amazing, beautiful insights into human nature, into Torah, and into life in general. So it's really an honor and privilege to have him here. And I hope he can spend even more time in Florida in the future. So without further ado, Rabbi Shoshan. As far as I know, this is my first time on TV. For Shusar and Marmor, it's a great pleasure to be in front of several, quite a few old friends, and, um, and also imagining that maybe there are people here who this is the beginning of our friendship. You never know what will happen in the future, and we'll talk about that night that we met in North Miami Beach. That would be a privilege, that would be a joy. Um, I'm very thankful to our host in terms of the shul, and our host in terms of Jonathan Dagmi. I don't know if all of you know this pioneering leader who is setting up the machines. He's so much more than that. He has a vision for sharing Torah with Klal Yisrael and is realizing that, that vision in an amazing way. Um, I'm very honored to be, you know, just another episode in, in all that Shul.com is doing. But if you haven't been exposed to that yet until tonight, keep your eyes open because he's constantly offering Torah opportunities in South Florida and beyond. And, uh, and you're, you're fortunate to be here among his... Um, his vision. Also, like any, most guest speakers, you're going to be interested in what I say principally because I'm a guest. In other words, you have everything you need in your rov. But that's the nature of it. You know, I was home last night, total non-celebrity. Rabbi Vishal, non-celebrity. I'm here tonight, and I'm just you know, um, what's the right word for it? I'm masquerading as a celebrity. But I'm excited to be here. If we accomplish great things tonight, I hope that will make you bond more completely with your rabbi, the one who had the vision for us having this here tonight. That would be a great accomplishment. So let's jump right into the topic. Everybody here knows the words lech lecha. Go for yourself. At the very beginning of Parshas Lech Lecha, Rashi says that the word Lecha is obviously extra, because it could be that Hashem would say to Avram, go, go from your land, etc. We'll get back to the word soon. But there's this extra word Lecha, go for yourself, for something more, something about you. And Rashi says that when Hashem says Lech Lecha, he means Lahana Ascha Otov Ascha, for your good and for your benefit. The Medrash in, in, in Bracious Rabbah brings an opinion of Rabbi Levi, where Rabbi Levi says, twice it says Lech Lecha, and I do not know which test was more difficult and therefore a greater accomplishment, whether the first or the second. And then on a technicality, Rabbi Levi concludes that it was, it was one of them. So we all know lech lecha me'artzecha umi'oladetcha umbe'esavicha el ha'aretz asher ha'eka. Go for yourself from your land, from your birthplace, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. That's a difficult test. You don't know where you're going. You're leaving everything you know. 
It sounds kind of like, it's sort of like New Yorkers coming to Florida immediately after COVID, but not exactly. And go. That's, that's difficult. I'm sure some of you are aware that the second time it says Lech Lecha is in the end of Parashas Vayera, where it says, Take your son, your only son whom you love, Yitzchak, Go to the land of Moriah and there offer him as a carbon. So there it again says, Lech Lecha, go for your benefit, for your good, and offer Yitzchak on Akedas Yitzchak. And says Rabbi Levi, I don't know which one of these tests is more difficult. The Slanam Rabbi the Nesiva Shalom, that sounds like an old name, but he lived until the year 2000. It's not that long ago. And if you're not familiar with the writings of the Nesiva Shalom, hit the penetration of this Hasidic work into all areas, Datilu Umi, modern, yeshivish, and so on, is absolutely breathtaking. It's, it's maybe unparalleled in the last, let's say, 50 years of any cross cultural awareness of, of, of learning that went from one side to the other of perceived lines. The, the, the Slanam Rebbe, the Nesiva Shalom, asks, what kind of questions that Rebbe Levi has? Which one is more difficult? Everybody in this room knows which one is more difficult. There's no question. It's obvious. Right? Does anybody here doubt that the more difficult test is slaughter your son? Seriously. I know you think that we're supposed to, you might... This crowd is not like small children, so a small child will raise their hand immediately and say, like, come up with something to fight with me about. But everybody here knows, everybody here knows which one of those tests is more difficult. Just emotionally, you know it. You know that as hard as it would be to go to a foreign land that I don't know, and that would be hard if somebody told you, go someplace on earth, and, and I'm not telling you where, and that means severing previous relationships. So you would think to yourself, well, that might be someplace you know, in Western Australia or mid, middle Africa or very freezing cold on the tip of South America. It could be any place. You'd say, I, I don't want to do that. That's tough. I don't want to sever this thing. I don't know where I'm going. That, that is tough. But it's, it's incomparably easier, it would seem, than take your only son whom you love and take a knife to his throat. That's impossible. That's a more difficult test than even self-sacrifice. It's like impossible. But I'll bring you a technical proof to my point. Obviously, it's more difficult because there isn't one moment in the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur liturgy when we say, oh, dear God, remember that we are the children of the man who left his father's house, his birthplace, and his land. And on account of his amazing achievement, please, Hashem, save us. That, 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 that phraseology doesn't exist anywhere. But all of... Zichronos is about this and many other mentions of, you, you know, remember us and just as Avraham overcame his rachamim, you should overcome your anger over us and so on. Zocher habris, remember Akedas Yitzchak. It's, 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 we, we, we bank our whole campaign for freedom and for, and for success on Akedas Yitzchak. So everybody knows which one is more difficult. How could Rabbi Levi have had any doubt? That's question number one. Question number two. You'll turn into a great nation. You'll become very wealthy and influential. That's fine. That's for your, that's for your benefit and for your good. But how is Akedas Yitzchak for your benefit and for your good? How could it be that you'll go there and you'll slaughter your son and that'll be lech lecha for your benefit and for your good? And the third question is, why does not Ram Avinu ever get a break? At 75 years old, he has to pass the test of going. At 100 years old, 99 years old, he has to pass the test of bris me, love, circumcision. You would think that a guy is 99. He's succeeded in nine tests or whatever it may be, exactly what order. At 137, he should already be let off the hook. Now I have to do a kedas yitzchak? And why is it that all three tests, those three major tests are the ones written in the Chumash, why is it that each of them is expressed with the language of walking? Lech lecha, go to the land. Lech lecha to Eretz Moria, 137. And even by bris milah, his halech lefanai ve'ye samim. Go in front of me, walk, hitalech, and be whole. What's the language of, of walking? What does that have to do with our lives? 
Why is that how Hashem chooses to express the tests of Avraham Avinu? So again, to review question number one, how could there be any doubt, but which is t- more difficult? Question number two, how is it for your benefit and for your good? The Question number three, what's with the walking and what's with the late stage constant tests? The Yisod HaVodah, which is the first Stan Rebbe, quotes the Arizal. The Arizal says something that is so profoundly important to every one of our lives. And that is that from the beginning of time till the end of time, there are no two people who have the same role in this world. No two people play the same role in the tikkun ha'olam, in the correction of the world from the time of the sin of Adam and Chava, that was nearly corrected at the time that Klai Yisrael received the Torah, and had they not bowed down to the Egel Hazav, the golden calf, it would have been good. It was nearly corrected again when Shaul HaMelech came into Eretz, they came into Eretz, and Shaul HaMelech nearly wiped out all of HaMelech. But there were near misses of this correction. No two people, not one pair of people has the same role in Hashem's world. And because that's so, everyone's exact conditions of their lives have been given to them according to what their individual specific role is. That's what we're here for. We're here to play our role in the cosmic solution of Kvod Shemayim, of honoring Hashem, of getting the world back to where it could have been if only they would not have eaten the fruit on that Friday. If only they would have made it into the Shabbos without eating it. If only we wouldn't have bowed down to Egal Zav. If only all of Amalek would have been wiped out. Every one of us has a role in that. And everyone's conditions are custom made for it. Let me try to explain this. If you have a great baseball player, he needs great baseball equipment. He needs a Louisville Slugger bat and a Wilson A2000 glove, if that's the spitz of gloves these days, I'm not sure. And he needs the right cleats. I just saw that in the Super Bowl, one of the teams was considering wearing seven-prong cleats because of the quality of the field. I have no idea how many is the normal prongs. I don't know if that's more or less. than, But you need the right stuff to do the right thing. And I don't know how many of you know this, but football cleats and baseball cleats are different. And soccer cleats are different. And obviously, wrestling shoes don't have any cleats. So to do your job, you need the right equipment. Imagine a baseball player who has a great bat that's proper for his size and weight distribution, length, and ounces, and so on. And he finds out that the perfect golf club has come up. Golf clubs haven't been improved, as have hockey sticks. So he would be a mashugana if he would say, on account of the fact that that hockey player has better hockey sticks than I do, and there's a new state-of-the-art hockey stick, if he was chasing that hockey stick for the purpose of his baseball game, he'd be a nut. In our lives, if we're chasing what someone else has, and I don't only mean physical, you know, material possessions, although that's also true. If I'm trying to say, I wish I was taller, or rarely do people say, I wish I was shorter, but it does happen. If I'm saying, I wish I was this or that, the Rebona Shalom gave us exactly what we need for our job, for my job. I have a job. And here's the thing about the conditions of a life. They come with what era you're born in, to whom, where, what your basic nature is. Some people are more generous naturally, some people are more stingy naturally, and so on. The conditions of your life come with what order you were born in your family. They come with what temptations you have and what's easy for you your wealth and your poverty, your physical attributes and the lack thereof. And there's a never-ending number of ingredients in that cocktail that are specific to you. I'm going to tell you something that if you don't know it, it makes people smile. I'm not 100% sure why people smile this when I say this, but most people smile when I say this if they never heard it before. I have an identical twin brother. Very few smiles. That means you probably knew in advance. You know what my brother says about identical twins? 
people are very excited about seeing adult identical twins because they assume that all identical twins are children. <laughs> but thank you, Hashem, some identical twins grow up to become adults. But of course, since they live in different places, okay, then it's like, oh my, I just met Rabbi Shoshan, but it was the wrong Rabbi Shoshan, and so on and so forth. <laughs> so we're, we're identical twins. That means born to the same parents, born on the same day, same era, same place. Many of the conditions of our lives are exactly the same. Now, there are many elements of good looks that were unfairly kept from my brother. <laughs> You know, and, and other such things. But even on the basic reality that in a family of five children, we're numbers four and five, and I'm the younger one and he's the older one, automatically changes the dynamic for each of us. Of course, there's so much more. There's so much more that makes two people different. In fact, one of the craziest things about life is that when two people are very, very, very much the same, the people who know them best see more in their differences than in their sameness. They, they just sort of put aside sameness, and then they go, oh, they're super different, because they see that one in relief of the other. So the two of us, have, we're, di we're different. And the conditions of our lives, of course, you know, diverged from there. We went to different schools at some points. We had natural inclinations that were different one from the other. We one to the other. We married different women. We have different kids. All kinds of things. So even people who are very similar, my role here and his role here in Hashem's cosmic plan, different. So no two people ever, not even identical twins, have the same role. And Hashem says to Avram, He's really speaking to all generations and says, Lech Lecha, go for your benefit and for your good means. Go and accomplish your role, you individual. Some of your role will become easier because of what I've given you. You're generous, you're wealthy, you're tall. I once gave this discussion, said how tall people, maybe their job is to reach things that shorter people can't reach. I was giving this talk somewhere out of Phoenix, like it was like tonight, I don't remember where it was. And immediately after the talk, I went to a grocery store to get some food for the next day. I walked into the cereal aisle, and a woman said to me, excuse me, sir, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I can't reach the honeycomb. Can you help me? And I sat there going, yes, that's what I'm talking about. You know, like, <laughs> my job in life is to help her get the honeycomb cereal. At least for that moment, that was it, that was my job. So some things are the good things that you're naturally given by Hashem, certain endowments. Other things, my friends, are things that are your challenges, things that if you overcome them, then you are part of that cosmic impact of Hashem's world. This generation, I once heard from a great God of Israel, that this generation can bring Mashiach, even though greater generations than we didn't, because we have a new set of nisyonos, a new set of tests, that they never faced, and are passing those tests with the temptations and the indulgences of this generation may be the very merit that we need in order to bring Mashiach. But that means that every one of us, when we do overcome those things, we are playing our part. So your exact cocktail, the good news and the bad news, is all part of what's been given to you for the mission of Lech Lecha, go to become you. For your benefit and for your good. There's nothing greater. There's no greater benefit and good than if you play your role. If you play your role, if you do your thing, that's what you're here for. That is what we're here for. So based on this, let's talk about a topic that not everybody loves to talk about, which is tests. In Hebrew there are two different words for two different kinds of tests. In English, we use the word test for a test of how well you know the material. And we also use the word test for a moral um, fortitude. But in, in, in Hebrew, that's not so. 
in Hebrew, when I want to know how, you, how well you know the material, that's called a bechina or mivchan. When I want to know what you're made of, can you withstand the temptation? Can you rise to fulfill your greatest self? That's called a nisayon. And nisayon comes from the word nes. Nes, of course, means miracle. But nes also means a big signpost, a, fla- a flag or a, or a poster. And that means that what happens when a person passes a test, passes a test, is that what comes out of them is a great sign of their abilities. That's why a miracle is called a test, a called nis- a nes, because it demonstrates the power of Hashem. It's when we see what's possible actualized. And when we see in ourselves what's possible, that's when we pass a test. When we think I can't, but I can. So tests are not something we seek. In fact, every morning we say, Veloli Deni Sayon. But tests are how we build the world. It's how I bring out of myself my part in Hashem's world. In fact, it's a crazy thing, but if you lift weights and it isn't difficult, you're going nowhere. It's only when you lift weights that are difficult that you're accomplishing something. And if you do it on, on that level, you can do more the next day. It's not delicious. What, what, a, what a punishment. I thought 125 was a big deal. Yeah, well, 125 is not a big deal. You've got to go to 140 or whatever it may be. So the more weight we put on the bar, if we can handle it, the more we develop ourselves and we demonstrate what I'm capable of. So there are some people, by the way, who have no tests. There are some people who have no tests of character. I know that sounds crazy. But those people are the people who think that if I want to do it, it's okay. Meaning they, don't, they, they think they have no tests of character, so they have no tests of character. They don't, they're, they're, there's no sense of, you know, um, of willpower questions because I want to. And I've determined that if I want to, then that's that. This is as religious as I'm going to be. This is as uh, modest as I'm going to be. This is as generous as I'm going to be. This is just what I am. I'm fixed. So that person has no test because they go, this, well, this is in my range. This is not in my range. I'm not, I'm not that observant. I'm not that religious. I'm not that this. I'm not that whatever. I'm just not that. No tests. But it's a, but, but, but it's a fallacy. It's the tests that bring out on us what we can become. So now let's go back to the original questions. And this is going to come to some, to some very practical questions for us. The Slonim Rebbe says that there are two kinds of tests. There's a test like the Akeda, and there's a test like leaving your father's home. And about this, Rebbe Levi says, I don't know which kind of test is more difficult. The test of the Akeda is impossibly difficult. Hashem says to you, do something that you feel you can't do. But it's super clear. Here's the job. And when I do, the job will be done. In life, we may have some very defining tests. Things that turn us this way or turn us that way. Like, a person could be in a relationship that is poisonous, for their personal potential. And their job is to get out of that relationship. Handle with care. Don't like run out of here right now and say, he said it. So, but if a person is at a point where they have total clarity that this relationship is poisonous in my life, it could be a business relationship. It could be a personal relationship. It could be something where I say, not, I'm not supposed to do this. By the way, the opposite could be true also. I'm not in a relationship that I ought to pursue. But I'm a coward. I'm not pursuing it. I'm afraid of getting rejected. I'm afraid of putting more weight on the bar. But it's clear. You could determine that this is the right thing to do. A person might say, I need to move. I I need to quit my job. I need to become Shomer Shabbos. I need to stop wearing that. I need to start wearing that. I need to eat those kinds of foods and not those. Whatever it may be, a person may face something and they're they're scared. It's a defining moment in life. Baruch Hashem, for the most part, Hashem does not give too many people many of those. 
There are those turning points. I'm, 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 I'm afraid to say it's four, it's five, it's six, whatever it may be. Different people have different things. But those moments when I know the difference between right and wrong, and the test is, can I? Will I? Do I have the strength? They're impossibly difficult. I'm going to tell you a story at the end of this that I'm a little nervous about doing on, on camera, but there's no choice. We have, to, we have to grow together. Maybe that's my test for tonight. But you face a test that's defining in your life, and it is so scary. I have such admiration for people who make the determination that they're going to become Shomer Shabbos as older adults. Because I imagine that's an even more difficult test than as a younger person, particularly because at some point they need to tell their children, whom they've said their whole life, nothing is more important than you. At some point they have to tell their children, I'm not going to be available for 25 hours by phone unless it's an emergency. Oh, and by the way, several times a year it's 49 hours. Oh, and by the way, sometimes it's 73 hours. Okay, that's, that's a whole different level of three-day yontif. I know those words scare some people here, and I know those words make some people here very happy. Usually that divides on gender lines, by the way. Okay, so it's a three-day It's a three-day yontif. I won't be available. I won't be available. That's scary. You're afraid of what's going to happen in your relationships. You're afraid. But you know the right thing. You know what the, what the choice is. It's clear in front of you right now. Are you ready to do it? Those make you cry. Those keep you up at night. Can I do it? Will I do it? And you're scared. But usually, those types of tests with the total clarity, but it's huge, like God's voice himself saying, you have to kill your son on my behalf, which will never happen to anybody here. But it did happen to Avram Avinu. It's super hard, but there's clarity. And when I pass the test, it's over. That's one kind of test. Happens a few times in life. Feels impossible. But then we do it. And everybody in this room has passed some of those tests and to be here tonight. No question in my mind. That's one kind. Now there's another kind of test. And here the Rebbe explains that it's t- it, is, it is summarized by the words, Lech lecha me'artzacha u'mimoladatcha u'mibesavicha. Go to become yourself from your land, from your birthplace, and from your father's house. Here's how this works. There are tests that are not huge, but they're constant. They ask you to defy your nature. They ask you to defy your training. They ask you to defy your geography. To transcend the assumptions of I'm stuck as I am and to become better. Here's an example. A man walks into his home. get off of me. Leave me alone, kids. I just got home. The first assumption is I am what I am. This is it. Like Impatience, it's difficult. I'm interested in those things that, that are prohibited to me. I, I'm, 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 I'm not generous. I'm not... Uh, I, I don't get up early. I don't get up early. What are you talking about, the davening? I don't get up early. He doesn't even know that there's a test going on. And here's the worst part about it. After you pass the test at 9 o'clock, you get another one at 9.01. And another one at 9.02. And another one at 9.03. And says the Rebbe, they divide it to three categories. Artsacha. An assumption that because I am born in a certain place, at a certain time, this is the way people like me are. I'm not going to be greater than that. Now, by the way, that's extremely pathetic because there's lech lecha, go and do your part. Really? You're not going to be greater than that? You're just stuck where you are because there's a certain city, I'm not going to name the city, maybe you know which city I'm talking about. There's a certain city where there's an assumption of being rude to one another. Like, I got to get on the train, you also got to get on the train. Dog eat dog world. Like, 
I'm sorry I banged into you. No, I'm not sorry I banged into you. I got to get on the train. I was once speaking about this topic to a young man from our shul many years ago, and he told me that he was born in a certain well-known southern city. I don't mean here, by the way, because this is a well-known northern city. You know, so the south ends at Jacksonville. I'm talking about, you know, a real southern city, west of here. Okay, so he, he was he born in a certain southern city. And he said that when he was in high school, he wanted to achieve well in school. But in the part of the country from which he's from, doing well in school was frowned upon by socially. Like, we don't, we, we don't, we're not studious here. And that was an assignment for him. That was a test for him. So there are certain, if you were born in a certain country, as you would say, chas v'shalom, I have to, uh, you know, my job is to obliterate the Jews. Or you might say that my job is to hate these other kinds of people. Because I'm from there. I'm from there, and that's the way we do it for where I'm from. That's called artzicha. And you know what? If you live your life that way, you're stuck in some mold, you'll never become l'cha. You'll never do your part. Everybody's part is different. Sometimes there are benefits of where you come from. Sometimes there's chesronos, problems where you come from. Transcend. That's artzicha. Moladatacha is the inborn traits that you have. Every person has inborn traits. Some of them are positive. Utilize them to make your music. Some of them are not so positive. I grew up with a guy who was very, very impatient on bordering on mean. Not bordering on mean, way past the border of mean. He was impatient and mean. And we happened to spend the year after high school together in the same yeshiva in Israel. So one day, another guy in the yeshiva comes over to me and says, you've got to wake him up. I said, why do I have to wake him up? You know him, he's your friend, and I'm not waking him up anymore because he's so disgusting to me when I wake him up and, I, and I'm not putting up with it anymore. You go wake him up. It's your problem. As if that because we're both from Chicago, it's my problem. Okay, this is what it is. It's my problem. I, I know the guy very well. I knew him then very well. I know him till today very well. He's naturally not that nice. It's true. He sees certain things and he's... He's critical of things. And natu nat naturally, he's critical. When we were younger, he was critical and outspoken. As he became a young adult and then an adult, he's only critical in his mind, not so outspoken. He may be less critical than he used to be. Here's the beauty of the story about waking him up. He's, he, he's really a fine mensch. But when his defenses were down, because he wasn't fully aware of his behavior because he was sleeping he reverted back to this kind of natural cause. But how admirable is he that when he was, did have control of his impulses, he was a wonderful mensch. People who know him in his adult life have no idea that he was you know, very difficult when he was younger. Because he's, he's made a mensch of himself. He didn't settle in and say, that's how I am, that's who I am, that's what I am. You know, I, I'm naturally I'm somebody who needs other people's attention. We can work on it. Naturally, I'm somebody who is stingy or careful. We can work on it. But the thing is that when we work on it, the reward for working on it is that the next moment I have to work on it again. It's not like the Akeda that if you pass the test or you quit the job or you take on that level of observance. Most people who take on a level of observance do not feel tested by it two, three weeks later. Maybe even not the next Shabbos. That's it. That's where I'm holding. I'm this. I'm, I'm, I passed that test. But when it comes to behavioral tests, to living up to who you could be every day, day and night, day in and day out, very difficult. The last one is Beis Avicha. You say, that's the way of my father. That's the way of my family. We yell at each other. We're kind of caustic. This is how observant we're going to be. This is what we're going to be. That's what, we're, we're like that. Many years ago, I was teaching a class about Shabbos. It was not instructing anybody to become more observant. Nothing about that. Just we were talking about, I don't know, the meaning of some zemer or something what it is. Casual environment. Guy screams out, Rabbi, I'm never going to become Shomer Shabbos. We'll call him Gary. That's not his exact name. I said, Gary, I don't know what you're talking about. What are you, what are you talking about? He says, my family were college football fans. And that's important to me and my dad. And, I'm never, and if I become Shomer Shabbos, I can't be a college football fan. Some of you may be aware, it's played on, it's played on Saturdays almost always. 
Can't be a college football fan, so I'm, I'm out. It was a beautiful moment, actually, because he was feeling, actually, he might become Shomer Shabbos. That's why he was screaming at me. Okay? It's 20 years ago, and he's, so far he's been correct. Okay? <laughs> but, but the reality is that he was saying, not in my family. Our family does it a different way. If you will just default to where you're from, what the family minig is, how, how you're, na- you're natural inborn, you have to take those things and utilize them to play your part, to play your music. But if you'll just default to them and say, I'm stuck where I am, you'll never be l'cha, l'chana aschlo, tevascha, for your benefit, for your good, and you'll never make the music that you were born to make in Hashem's symphony. So now let's look at it again. Which test is more difficult? The big, huge tests of life that make you cry and you can't, and I don't know if I can do it, and I would never want to have a test like this again. It's so painful. Or the daily tests of improving your character, of becoming a mensch, of overcoming your inborn traits or your family traits or your geographical traits. Which one of those is more, is more difficult? That's very hard to answer. It depends on the person. That's Rabbi Levy's suffix. That's his doubt. I don't know which one is more difficult. Akeda style tests or lech lecha. Get out of yourself and go become yourself. Go become something greater. So I'll tell you a story. Many years ago, twenty. Nine years ago, accidentally, I ended up in yeshiva in Baltimore. Really, it was Mina Shamayim. I was planning to go to college in New York, and I wanted to rethink that, so I came back from Israel. And my, my father was not of the type to send you back to Israel. We didn't come home in the middle of the year. You know, nothing like that. If you were going to Israel to learn, you got one ticket to and from, that's it. So when I decided I needed to come back before Pesach, that was it. My second year was over. So I said, well, what, what can I do? What can I do in America for the rest? Of, do, do whatever you want. I said, okay, you know what? I'll take a very scary leap. For me, that was a very scary leap. I'll go to Neri Yisrael, Baltimore. I, I remember that specifically, I bought this style of yarmulke on the way to the airport when I was going to the yeshiva. Very scary decision. I'll go there. I'm going for two months. So after two months, I had realized that this is the path I need to stay on. But in our family life, and it was a different era then in the early 90s, and, and I'm a first-generation American, that kind of decision was not, not in the cards. You know, it's time now to get on with real life. Like you go to a real university and get a, and get a real training and get a real job and so on and so forth. Some of you are smiling and laughing about that because you know what I'm talking about. Others, maybe, it's, just, it's a little different now. There's a lot of way, the connection between post-secondary education and financial well-being and otherwise is different than it was back then. Perfectly reasonable position my father had. So basically, in the summer of 1995, we had a standoff. And it was the most painful time in my life. I don't really like talking about it. It makes me tear up. It was the most painful moments of my life. I hope it will always remain as the most painful with God's help. And I remember so many tears, so much, so much at risk, so, so, so much pain. Am I going to do this? Am I going to go to the, am I going to stay in yeshiva in spite of the fact that my, it will may cause me to lose a relationship with my, my dad, my mom, even most of my siblings were very against it. It's a very, very scary time. So in the end, I decided to go for it. There were very negative financial implications for me associated with it. Very negative. There was great risk of the relationships. That's important I interject here that everything worked out great. Everything worked out great. I mean, I, I, we're, not, we're not here to discuss my life story, but... Everything worked out beyond, beyond great. Worked out great, and every relationship worked out great. There was nothing to worry about. Everything was great. Baruch Hashem. 
but not initially. Initially, it was scary and it was painful. And I did it anyway. Basically, I sacrificed everything to stay in yeshiva. So now fast forward to the next three and a half years. Single guy living in the yeshiva dormitory, eating my meals in the yeshiva. I had a problem. My problem was that lunch was at 1 and dinner was at 6.30. And that was too long of a gap for me. But there's another problem, which is that they actually start serving dinner at 5.30 because the high school dinner is at 5.30. And because many of the Bachram and the yeshiva go to college certain nights, including me. And so you can already access the food at 5.30. And they don't really take attendance. There are no real rules. You're there to learn. You're there to benefit. But you don't get like points off if you leave at 5.45, 6, 6.05, 6.10. But you do face a big problem at 6.30, by the way. Not only is it 6.30, but now there's a line. Okay? For me, there was such a massive nisayim about whether or not to finish afternoon Seder every day and stand in the line and get the food and be hungry from 5.50 or so and on. I had not learned the magic of the protein bar yet. That only came later in my life. My food source was the, was the yeshiva. That's what I was going to... And I'm embarrassed to tell you, but it's instructive, so I share it with you. That I, who gave up, all, had no money. I had to, I had to be mefarnas myself with work and tzedakah. Had tremendous relationship pains. I was willing to give up everything for learning but I was not willing to stand in line for, for supper, for dinner. And in the approximately 900 nights that comprised that era, I doubt if 40 times I stayed till 6.30. You say, how's that possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. Because the question is, is it easier to die Al-Kiddush Hashem or to live Al-Kiddush Hashem? That's not so posh yet. It's very difficult to die, to take the bullet, if God forbid you're tempted to do something that requires that. And it's very difficult to live up to your personal potential every day. And sometimes those of us who can pass major tests have trouble passing minor tests. Sometimes some of us are great at minor tests and we have difficulty passing major tests. For me personally, frankly, I find the major tests exhilarating. I don't want major tests, but like, I hear somebody's getting married, I can easily get to the wedding. There's a Leviah, I'll drop everything and go. But on the occasion that I don't drop everything and go, do I remember to make the phone call later on and check in with them on day 11, not just on day 4? I get busy. I get distracted. Maybe you could even say, I don't care, I don't care enough. So that's what Rabbi Levy was bothered by. Is it more difficult to pass the big tests or the day in, day out, small ones. But my friends, here's the crucial point. To play your part, the only answer is you got to pass both. You have to be the greatest benefit that you could ever have is that you yourself play your part in Hashem's plan for the universe. That you become more generous if that's your problem. That you become more responsible if you're too generous. Yet you become the type who can get up in the morning, even though I said I can't get up in the morning. And that when life brings you a fork in the road, I can't help myself but to quote Yogi Berra, take it, but really make the right decision. Make the right decision. Be courageous enough to say, this is the path I have to go down. This is what I'm going to do for myself and my family, for my tzibur, for my congregation, for my community. So tests are the answer to making our music. And here's the scary part. If we don't pass the tests, if we wimp out on either half of these things, then we're stealing from the world our music. Only I can make that music. And that's a theft from Hashem's plan and from what we can give to others also, the example we can set, and the beauty we can put in the world. 
I want to end with one just practical example, and then the hour is late because we started late, but I'm, I'm happy to stick around for as long as you wish. And I'll take a few questions, whatever. There's a, as I understand it, there's a proliferation of davening options in South Florida that there wasn't five years ago. Is that fair? Yeah. Like massive, like the numbers, especially maybe a tip north of here went from three options to 50 options or something like that. Okay. But even without that, even where there's more than one option, Sometimes we underestimate the profound power of being kovea makum, of establishing that this is where I can be found, when I can be found, and with whom I can be found. This is the place that I do my Judaism. In case you think the rabbi put me up to this, he did not. He did not. And I, and I don't have an agenda. I, I just feel, I want to bring out a, a, a really nuanced point that I think is very important. It's not my, it's not my insight. Why is it important to be Kovea Mokom and Zman and with whom? So one angle comes from the Kabbalah. That when I have a set life, Many good things are b grow, grow out of that. I'll just give you an example of somebody who, let's say, never misses Zman Kriyashma, even of the Magen Avram. And, and Bitsibor, he, he gets up early, he's always on time to the earliest halachic Zman that's necessary. But sometimes it's there, and sometimes it's there, and sometimes it's there. Sometimes it's with those guys, sometimes it's with those guys, with those guys. What's happening is he's not Kavua, he's not set. And he's creating a system of inaccountability, maybe subconsciously, maybe consciously. He's creating a system of inaccountability. No one's expecting me. They don't know if I'm coming or I'm not coming. And, and, and things are haphazard. They may be effective, but they're haphazard. If he would set a time and set a place, then many of the tests of life will go away because it's set. I can't stay up into the middle of the night if I'm totally committed to this or that in the morning. I can't appear and disappear and whatever if I have a chavrusa who's waiting for me. That's a whole different thing than I did do the daf. That's a whole different thing than I, I do chasadim, but not the chesed that they can count on me for. But there's something even deeper here, which is that... Um, Rav Shimshon Pincus says that Chazal placed a great uh, emphasis on, on kivius, on setting yourself a set time and a set place. They placed a great emphasis on this, says Rav Pincus, because the one who goes around is the opposite of the one who's always in the same place. How? The one who's always in the same place is a provider of that service. Davening with a minion is the best example of this. There is a 7.30 shachris because I'm always there. And now people have that item to shop from. Well, there's a 7.30 over there at, I don't know when the davening is here, but 7.30 over there in, in Young Israel, there's a 7.30 over there in wherever. If I'm the one who's always can be counted on, then I am a provider of that. If I am shopping around, I have transformed myself from a giver into a receiver. And everybody knows that the higher form is to be a giver. I have, I have transformed myself into a shopper. And other people provide that for me. But when we are kovea ourselves in whatever it may be, when people can count on us, when you can count on me, then what's happening is the world benefits from this because I am a provider of that. And I think that, that 
proliferation of choices can have a negative impact on a certain level of this very deep psychological reality of is, am I giving or am I taking? And the koach ha this is now Rav Dessler, koach, this inner space of where I'm taking diminishes me. But this space where I'm giving is what I was brought here to do. And it, and, and it feeds all kinds of parts of my life. If I'm a taker, then I am tempted by all kinds of things to take. Maybe not technical theft. And, but if I'm a giver, then I'm focused on Zulati, on somebody outside of me, and that's a benefit. And I've changed who I am. So it just sounds like it's just, I dive in here, there, sometimes there, sometimes there. By the way, in marriage, it's also a wonderful thing if your spouse knows when you're going to be back. You know, there's a lot of jokes about that. Like, you know, we had a fast day on, on a Friday recently. There were jokes all over the country. Like, still go home late so that your wife doesn't learn how early you could be home, you know, on Friday night. All right? It's just a joke, of course. But the, but the point is that there are, nobody would even see this as a test. But the world is built by those who build it, by those who provide. And how beautiful would it be to be in the Hashem's orchestra, to be playing the music that provides, instead of responding to the provider by being someone who receives. So I think my point now is a little esoteric, but it's just how deep the point goes about how if we're focused on what we, on, on certain positive behaviors, even though they're so baseline, they're so baseline, they lead to lech lecha, to you becoming you for your benefit and for your good. The greatest that could be is that you're building Hashem's world and you're doing your personal potential. So that's what I have to share with you. I'm excited. I hope that you benefited. I'm excited that the world, if we presented it properly and we, and we shared it properly, that the world will benefit from your music. That in Hashem's cosmic plan, you'll make your, you'll make your difference. I'll make my difference. And we'll, and we'll benefit together from the victory of, of, of all of that. And we'll see Hashem's Geula. Feel free to leave. Any questions, though? Any, any comments? Arguments? Hatred? Okay, we'll leave the, we'll leave the love for off camera then. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>